This meeting is being recorded. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and as such, I've asked all of our attendees to please mute for the beginning portion of the webinar to maintain the quality of sound. I will be moderating the question and answer session with our speakers at the tail end of our time together. So you can feel free to place your questions in the chat during our conversation, or when the time comes, you can use the hand raise functionality on Zoom to indicate you have a question and would like to, to ask it out loud. And I will unmute you once your turn to ask that question, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible before the end of the hour. All right, that was a lot. So without further ado, I'll turn the session over to Professor Staggs to get us started. Sarah, would you please take it away? Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, great. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Alumni Relations for inviting me to do this webinar. We are really pleased to have Melissa Tuga. It's a, it's a very big deal and we'll get to that in a minute. I see so many um, of the students I had, so many young alums who have signed on. So hello to all of you. You probably recognize my office where you sat with me for <laughs> many advising sessions. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm going to just talk a little bit and kind of give us some framing before we get into some questions with Melissa. So we're gonna have a little bit of a history lesson here. Uh, so yes, welcome everyone to our webinar, Ballet is Woman. I'm Sarah Skaggs, Director of the Dance Program at Dickinson College. I use this quote, Ballet is Woman, as our starting point for today's discussion. When speaking about ballet, many people quote Balanchine's infamous quote, from 1976. What they don't quote is what follows Ballet is Woman. Balanchine goes on to say, man is a better cook, a better painter, a better musician, composer. Everything is man, sports, everything. Man is stronger, faster, why? Because we have muscles and we're made that way. And women accept this, it is her business to accept. She knows what's beautiful. Men are great poets because they have to write great poetry for women, odes to beautiful women. Women accept beautiful poetry. You see, man is the servant, a good servant. In ballet, however, woman is first. Everywhere else, man is first. But in ballet, it is the woman. All my life, I've dedicated my art to her. So we use this in our dance history class to kind of give us a kind of a feminist lens to sort of really unpack what's going on in ballet. So this is the opening of a very important essay by uh, dance scholar Anne, Anne Daly. Um, and the, the title of this essay is called The, Bal the Balanchine Woman of, of Hummingbirds and Channel Swimmers. So I think this is a great way to frame our discussion today. So I'm also really overjoyed that we're going to have Melissa to talk about her most recent work in, in the Boston Ballet Initiative choreographer. So before we launch into our discussion um, with Melissa, let's I have, to have a, a, just a few, a little bit of a historical context for you. So as we know, for many, many years, there've been a lot of articles, especially recently written about sounding the alarm really about the growing gender gap and I might add um, gender pay gap in ballet companies, right? So if Balanchine tells us that ballet is woman, why is there still a lack of women running the show? The gender gap in ballet seems ironic for obvious reasons, but we shouldn't be surprised. We know there's a lack of female movie directors, orchestra conductors, opera directors, or shall we say, do men move mountains and women move their bodies? So it should come as no surprise that, that ballet is a male dominated form. I mean, men run the companies, they collect the money. Most importantly, they choreograph for women. They design women's movements, the moods, the stories, amplifying 19th century fairy tales, whereby women are portrayed as swans, fairies, birds, sylphs, willies. They either die or they're promoted to the throne as a queen or a princess. Our favorite classical ballets that we know and love today, Giselle, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, The Nutcracker, center on the marriage plot. As dance scholar Sally Baines notes in her text, Dancing Women, Female Bodies on Stage. It's a text we use in our dance history class. It's a text whereby she uses a feminist lens to examine how classical ballet is structured around the marriage plot. That is, will she or won't she? Will she be caught 
find her prince, be captured, will she marry or will she die? Baines tells us that the ballerina's existence is wholly dependent on her relationship to a man, to the wedding, the transfer of power, and the marriage of kingdoms. So ballets started in the Renaissance as dance activities within actual weddings that were taking place. When the ballet transfers to the proscenium stage, we see the reenactment of weddings. Yes, and so the pas de deux is usually about the, the um, comings and goings of, of whether or not um, the prince and prince will marry. So the very definition of classical ballet is its adherence to tradition. And that tradition is one of dominance by men in positions of power. They control the narrative, the story, the steps, costuming sets. They literally set the stage for women to appear. Now we don't have time, we don't have time to go into all of the history of ballet, but there's two important people you should know from about from ballet history. And one, of course, is Louis XIV, the Sun King, who ruled France in the 17th century. And he used ballet as an instrument of power in his court. Courtiers had to know how to dance, literally stay on their toes, or they would be banished from court. Beware of a misstep. And secondly, we need to know about Maurice Petipa, the ballet director of the Imperial Russian Ballet from 1870 to 1910, choreographer of our be beloved ballets, Swan Lake, The Nutcracker, Sleeping Beauty, to name a few. Here too, ballet is used as a form of statecraft, of displaying power in the form of high culture. Ballet stories display the aristocracy, the comings and goings of the kings and queens and princesses and prince who held power in 18th century France and 19th century Russia. So obviously the topic of power and ballet is a very interesting one. Uh, before we go down that rabbit hole, let us fast forward to our current moment in which we do see more and more women being hired as artistic directors, lead choreographers and executive directors. So it's very exciting for us to witness the much needed initiative by the Boston Ballet, whereby they invited five female artists to create works on the company. And one of those female artists is Melissa Toogood. And just a little bit, I've known Melissa for many, many years. She's one of the best known dancers working today. And Stephanie read her um, biography. And those of you who really follow the ballet world might know Pam Tanowitz, who has come to a lot of prominence with the new work she's doing with the New York City Ballet. Well, Melissa is Pam's rehearsal director and I would say also muse. Um, also, Melissa has come to Dickinson many years ago, um, helping Pam put a piece on the students. So this was part of the Ewing Fund. Um, and I'm not sure this was in 2013. And I think some of the students here might have remembered that. Um, and I know Melissa from, you know, the downtown dance scene um, mm -hmm. I was a part of for many years. So to see Melissa as a choreographer now has been really, really exciting. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Um, let's start into some questions here. I just wanted to, I'm just curious, how did you get involved in choreographer? Did you have connections with the Boston Ballet? Um, unknowingly. <laughs> Uh, Miko, the director there, had um, seen me perform in Boston uh, when I'd been there on tour. And also, uh, I'm a regular at the Vail Dance Festival. I think this, this summer will be my eighth season in Vail, which is um, predominantly a ballet festival. Um, I'm kind of their resident modern dancer, <laughs> I would say. Um, so Miko had seen me perform and um, was a fan of my work as a dancer and contributor to the process of other people's work. And he kind of um, contacted me out of the blue and invited me to participate. And um, my initial reaction was, no, <laughs> I, this is not what I do. Um, I still am uncomfortable with the title choreographer. <laughs> I had an amazing opportunity to make a dance. And, um, you know, when he, when I got the email, 
um, it was summer of 2020, I think. So, you know, COVID was in full swing already. And um, I had seen my work as a dancer, teacher, stager just kind of disappear like that. And so um, I also, at that time, my son had just turned two. So it seemed like a really good um, challenge for my brain body, everything at that time. So I was considering it and I had a phone call with him. and He um, gave me complete permission to fail. And that's what made me think I should attempt it. Um, you know, I chore choreographed little things here and there. And of course with, um, I worked with a lot of different people and everyone's process is very different. So um, I do, make things in other people's work, but to be the leader of something and have to come up with all the ideas to start with, um, it was very daunting and terrifying. And um, he quoted, I think it was Brian Eno to me um, saying, you know, that um, I'm gonna butcher the quote, but the idea was that, you know, you're not a pilot. You can, if you crash the plane, you can get up and walk away. And so I was like, okay, I trust you then. I'm gonna try this. Yeah. So that, that's how it initially I made the commitment to make a piece for them. So um, curious listening to you. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's quite brave. I mean, also, I mean, it's the uh, Boston Ballet, there's a lot of pressure. Do, do you feel mm -hmm. any pressure to, sort of reach back into the ballet tradition. And I mean, I know you're really trained, yeah. I mean, as a ballet, you're a ballet dancer and also a Merce Cunningham dancer, which is kind of modern ballet, I think. But did you feel a pressure to-, to not, a, not a pressure. I just felt like it made the most sense. I mean, it was interesting when you were talking at the beginning about the Sleeping Beauty and things like that. I remember my grandfather would record ballets for me when I was young, like 11, because he just thought I would, want to watch them and I remember being like five minutes and being like I really am not into this it, like I always took my ballet training seriously because I was always told if I want to be a professional dancer I have to but um it was never the aesthetic that I was um wanting to pursue and I have a great respect for it and like I said I took my training very seriously but the product that I um, wanted to be a part of, always wanted to be something new. Um, and so I think that's what also brought me to MERS is because I could use all of that ballet training, but in a way that felt more equal. Like the men, I always loved jumping and I had to jump as big and as slow as the men and the men had to do as much adagio as the women. And so um, the equality of the physicality in Mercer's work is something that always drew me to it. Um, but when working at the Boston Ballet, I really, something that I really learned from Pam is that you have to deal with the people in the room, otherwise it's gonna fail. And so I wanted to bring my embodied knowledge to them, but also not ignore who they are. Like one of the first questions they asked me, we had our first rehearsals on Zoom and they're like, do you want the women in point shoes? And I just started laughing. I was like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And that is just like so stupid of me. Of course, you're gonna ask that <laughs> about like jumping. I was like, no, but then I decided to allow them to wear flats because I'm like, I'm not gonna completely change who they are. Um, so we didn't go barefoot. <laughs> But I was like, no point shoes. Um, and I think that um, you, know, you also have to honor their training. And I wanted to push them, but also not, I think if I was going to, I had to empower them. If they didn't feel ownership over the work, then it also wasn't going to come through in a, um, in an honest way. So I really tried to kind of walk a line between pushing them in a different direction and also just honoring who they are as people.
Yeah, that, that's so interesting because, uh, well, I have now, of course, I have my my questions, but I've you know doubled those questions now <laughs> listening to you talk. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the point shoe issue because uh, I saw the piece, a uh, Tyler Peck's piece with Boston Ballet, and they're in point shoes, and so, yeah. and then I looked closer and I thought, wait, are they in bare feet? Wait a minute, and but they were yeah in the in the ballet in a slipper, so that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so I was what I would, but one thing I thought was just the piece is just so beautifully nuanced, and um, one thing I noticed is. All of your dancers, you have three men and three women. Uh, no. Is that right? It depends on the, the night he saw oh, the piece. Okay. I actually, I wasn't trying to make a statement about gender. I, but, I was wondering. Um, okay, some yeah. roles, the casting, the same part is a man and a woman in different cast. Um, okay. The process initially was on Zoom. Um, and you know, I was still on stay at home orders pretty much when I started making material in a small room in my Brooklyn apartment. <laughs> and so my initial idea to get started was I'm going to make a series of short solos and then figure out how to string them together. Um, so on Zoom, I taught everybody that they gave me. Um, there was only one dancer that I knew already, my cow. He was a student. Uh, that I worked with at Juilliard. Um, so I knew he had some modern dance training. He was like the one person I begged for. <laughs> I was like, I just need one person that has a little more understanding of where I'm coming from. Um, and so I taught them all these like five short solos on Zoom. And, you know, it's ballet company to have a lot more resources than I'm used to working with. So I had two plus casts. And so then I had to kind of like figure out who was in which cast and some dancers I felt um, were more similar to each other or I saw um, like one particular solo. I was like, well, Haley and Paolo to me are the ones that this speaks to the most. So it didn't matter to me that one was a woman, one was a man. Um, so some parts depending and then how casting worked out with all the other pieces on different nights Sometimes there's one man and five women in the piece. Sometimes there's three men, three women. So um, I think uh, then the piece does look different <laughs> every night, but um, I wasn't trying to consciously make a statement about gender. I was just like, for these particular people, this is what works best. Yeah, I saw that. I, I was just, I was wondering though, if there was any conscious decision about that, but um, yeah, now you do talk about on the, the small little clip on our YouTube too, talking about making these individualized solos. So that really comes through in your piece. Each dancer is highly individualized and yet the choreography, there seems to be some sort of beautiful nuanced unspoken agreement about giving each other the time and space to do their solo but yet you're you're keeping the group very cohesive without necessarily resorting to unison because when we see ballets we see a lot of unison movement that's the way you keep a group repeating unison and we see the core and the soloist and the principal we see rank mm -hmm. but in your piece what it was so beautiful was the individuality but yet this co very quiet cohesiveness and they're not doing the same movement. Right. Um, that was really important to me. I'm yeah. so glad that kind of came through. Um, when I talked to Russell, um, he's, I think the assistant artistic director. I've worked with him in Vail for many years um, about the type of dancer I wanted to use because he was helping me with costume because I didn't know the company. I was like, I don't totally know what I'm gonna make but I know that texture is really important to me and something I wanna really um, explore with them. So like the amount of force someone uses in the same step and how you approach the texture of movement. Um, I, I think something that is very different for them is not dancing exactly to music, which obviously is a long-standing tradition from Merce and John Cage through 
I would say probably most people working in downtown dancing now, you know, we have landmarks and music and accompaniment, but not dancing to the beat. So um, I talk to the dancers a lot about listening to each other physically. Um, so they cue from each other and also how just thinking about a movement in a different way can change how it manifests. Um, I feel like I'm starting to get lost with the question now, but yeah. No, Am I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, one of the solos I made when I taught them, I was like, actually, I love how everyone does it. So it, it became a group section, but I told them not to be totally together, but you know, still to be aware of each other so that they're not in unison, but they don't get too far away from each other. So there is a, um, something that binds them. But I also think that the first thing I said to myself is I don't want to make a pandemic piece. And then the pandemic kept going and going and going and going. And I was like, I can't ignore what this has done to me physically. And so there isn't a lot of touching or contact in the piece, but there is like this energy between people. Like when I first went into the studio with them, it was a year ago before we had vaccination and they had very strict protocols. I felt very safe there. You know, you could only go up one staircase and down a different one, mm -hmm. but I wasn't allowed to touch them. And I think a lot of that um, shared energy with space made its way in, um, in a way that I, I'm happy with. <laughs> That, that's that's so interesting and quite touching actually to hear i mean yes you say i'm not going to make a pandemic piece but yet all of these sort of uh, invisible things that happen to us about touching and not touching and where to go you know duke i think it what i recognize is this sort of nuance that that they are listening to each other mm -hmm. and like when you when you you ask them to listen to each other uh, that does definitely come through that sort of like quiet, there's a quiet grace in terms of letting everyone do their solo. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're not using unison and also you're not using partnering, right? Because they couldn't touch. And, you know, we go to the ballet and we see a lot of partnering. We're used to seeing partnering. Yeah. As historically, as I mentioned, that has to do with, well, a feminist lens says a marriage plot. It has to do with men and women and romance and becoming mm -hmm. kings and queens. But also, even in modern ballets, there's a lot of partnering, but yeah. There, yeah. But I also think it comes from the group of people because, like you said about, you know, the rank system in ballet companies, like I got, I didn't realize until I was looking at the program at the premiere how many principals I had in my cast. Like, I really loved the energy of this company in the room. Like, I didn't feel any of that tension and hierarchy and competition like you sometimes feel in other ballet companies and um so I really don't think I would have got the desired result necessarily everywhere I would have maybe tried to make this piece so I, I actually do really um applaud the culture at Boston Ballet actually from my experience there with them um all the dancers were very open and patient with me I mean I told them, I'm like, I don't usually make work. I'm a very experienced dancer, stager, teacher, but not a choreographer. And they treated me like I was. <laughs> um, and all of them were very, very um, willing and excited. I think also with the pandemic, they were just happy to be making something and working too, like we all are. <laughs> Well, what, what, what were some of the challenges that you faced in the studio with the, the dancers? I, mean, um, I think mainly sometimes scheduling, you know, when you have big companies, like we, I'm used to working with smaller groups of dancers um, in the modern dance world where you have one cast, that's it. Even Mercy's company was big, but all 14 people were in most of the dances. If someone's not there, you, you just don't work, you don't perform. But in the ballet company, people get switched around all the time. Um, so sometimes I was like, I'd be there and I was like, oh, I only have two dancers today. So then that's why I made a short duet for um, Haley and Patrick. So, um, I mean, that's something I always also really learned from Pam and Merce is, um, 
you know, have a plan, but then really deal with what's going on in the room. I'm like, I had two people, so I made something for the two of them. Um, I think that was the the biggest challenge is, um, oh, I have everybody here except the two people that share a part. <laughs> so I, you know, so just occasionally it was just some scheduling stuff, um, knowing that like even after this program, they went straight into another program of three major ballets. So, you know, you're getting people pulled here and there. Sure. I, I was thinking about um, also not dancing to music. Did you give them counts? How were they, how do they deal with the phrases and the solos, even if there wasn't music they were dancing to? But did you have counts? Did they find their own rhythm? How did you, how did the rhythm, um, how was that structured? I think just repetition, doing it over and over again with me. Um, you know, I'm still, when I'm teaching, I try not to fully physicalize stuff unless I have to, just because I, I don't want to dictate how people interpret things. But then sometimes you just have to do it. And so um, I think doing things with me over and over again and just the repetition that we're used to in dance, um, you eventually find a timing. I think the very first thing was the thing I had to like go over the most. It's not going too fast to like, mm. or it's not doing too much. Um, it often became very physical and I had to be like, okay, just think of it more of a meditation, more on a cellular level. It's like, pretend there aren't hundreds of people right here, <laughs> you know? So going back to like really um, trying to be very present to every little thing that you're doing at that time. Um, I guess that would be the other challenge was the music. Um, I had a good friend of mine make the music for me new, but we were using a MIDI version. So like an electronic version that he had made for me, which initially um, I had hoped to keep a lot of the electronic to it. Cause that for me felt more like me and from my kind of lineage. Um, but the musical director pushed to, now that they could hire more musicians. So then he had to orchestrate the whole thing. And I all of a sudden went from like a couple of instruments and the electronic score to like a 60 piece orchestra, which was kind of overwhelming. Um, so I think it was a little bit nerve wracking for the dancers potentially to like not totally know the music until the day of the show, not having heard it, but it actually really excited them. And I think um, it also helped with the listening aspect and being super present because mm -hmm. they had to not only pay attention to the other dancers and how they were dealing with the live music, um, but to also listen to the live music and like, is this the same sound that I'm used to going on this particular thing? You know, so they have landmarks, um, but I really, wanted to consciously give them some choices in there and that was the most exciting thing for me is when I saw them actually making choices within the set framework like sometimes I had to rein them in or push them a little more but that's when it got really exciting for me when they um I saw possibility spark in their brain about how they could try something yeah, that was going to be my next question. How much agency did they have in, in the work you gave them? You said they made um, choices. I mean, was it like three quarters choreographed and then they would decide like direction or it, it, it's all choreographed, but more I gave them more um, freedom in terms of timing. So the very beginning and the very end, um, I pushed Patrick and Subin to they're the like sole person moving through the group at the end to try a different spacing each time and like get really close to people, even though you're about to do a turn into an arm um, to kind of play with the spacing. And then the other dancers, their timing is free, but they have a set order of when they would do their position and they know after this person, then they do the soften and then move. But they never really know when the person before them is going to go. So that I liked that kind of tension that it created between them. Um, so it was more timing and sometimes spacing. Um, and in the creation, creative process of it, um, one of the things I did to start was work with them all individually. 
um, I created like a score or list of things and um, like um, to the floor and and an animal movement or like um, look three times or um, you know just a kind of score that was going to be my initial idea was that it was going to be a background score so that when they weren't doing their solo they would have something kind of minimal to be doing um, entrances and exits are very hard and I didn't want to just like have them walk on or walk off um, so I, I knew I wanted them all on stage all the time so that was kind of something I started with as an idea to like always have them have something to do but that also got me to um, I got to know them all a little bit and so some of those decisions came straight from their body experience um, so Abigail, I know that like this one move she does is her dog Rupert. <laughs> and so um, it helped us get to know each other and kind of create a rapport. But then I, I went in and like messed with it and chose the timing and stuff. But so they had some choices with that thing that we first kind of built together. So that's so interesting to hear. I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking that ballet dancers and uh are just so used to presenting movement like big movement mm -hmm. that it has to it has to be big in these opera houses and presentational and to the audience right and then the radicalness of seeing like hardly your dancers hardly ever face forward they're always sort of facing in and so how was it for them to kind of kind of well not tone it down or to kind of make these these beautiful shapes you have them do yeah so, i mean that, that actually like, honestly they it was harder for some than others. Yes, of course. Um, but I think when it, when it was challenging for them, I just had to get really specific physically, and that helped. Um, I had a Graham teacher that I absolutely adored, and he would talk about um, you know not presenting to you, you, draw them to you, and so you know the center is where you are. And I always remember that. And I'm like, okay, how do you draw an audience to you rather than being like, look at me. And um, I always found a lot more power in that. And so that was something I thought about how to help them kind of do that. And I think to really connect with themselves inside through from a very um, specific physical place was helpful. That's so interesting. And thank you for that, that Graham quote. That's really interesting because I think when we know of ballet, at least what we know uh, sort of on the surface is that you are you are presenting to the king. He is sitting, sitting right in the or orchestra, literally. So of course you don't turn your back to the king. Everything is frontal and presentational. Yeah. So the idea the is held differently because you're like pushing your chest forward instead of like yeah. having the space in your back. <laughs> yes, you're talking about the back. And so now you're talking about drawing the audience into this just beautiful personal experience um so th that i mean i don't know if, if everybody would quite sort of pick up on that but that that's a very interesting of total paradigm shift right and so um of course the modern dance movement is that's what we're doing and of course mm -hmm. we're in charge of that but i think this makes us wonder now so with for the boston ballet and what you bring to it is this more modern dance or is this modern ballet do these kinds of questions even matter. Um, and then to me, it's just movement. <laughs> I know that matters to students who go, well, I don't want to study modern dance. I want to study ballet. So we're always trying to find. Yeah, but no ballet company is just the ballet company anymore. And there you go. <laughs> um, I mean, it's really, they're really rep companies. And so it's actually, I think, quite challenging to be a ballet dancer now because you're constantly thrown into a different process. Mm -hmm. a different um like your the instincts that you hone with one person not necessarily going to work with the person you're working with in two hours so i mean i know it's, it's not easy um so i i mean the dancer it's my main goal I, like i knew i wasn't going to make a masterpiece i mean this is the first dance <laughs> you know but i just wanted I feel like it was successful for me because the dancers expressed to me that they really got something out of it and it was meaningful time for us together in the studio. Um, 
And I, I think that's part of what I really leaned into is my experience as a coach and how to get them there and to um, understand how to make choices without me telling them what kind of choices to make in the end. Um, so they really, I, I feel like they really understood where I was coming from. We did have a touchy moment before the dress, the final dress rehearsal. I was like, oh my God, I feel like it's falling apart a little bit. You know, it was like that typical thing where you get on stage and all of a sudden they are worried about like what they're presenting to an audience and like worried about falling down and like, am I holding this devil pay? And I just had to remind them that that wasn't what was important. That's not what the piece was about. And we had a really good um, pep talk before the final dress rehearsal. I was like, look, this is your last chance to really try it the way that we did in rehearsal. Like you got there in the studio. It's not really gonna work unless we go for it in that way. And I'm like, if it doesn't work right now, it's fine. It's dress rehearsal. If you fall down, it doesn't matter. And it was amazing. And I was like, okay. Just do that every time. <laughs> so I just, again, I had to give them permission to not be so concerned about the picture. Yeah, and what you're doing is you're upending this idea of perfection. Perfection yeah. is that ballet is about perfection, the absolute mm -hmm. tippy top of perfection. Yeah, and we have that in us too, but then you have to kind of rise above that expectation and understand that your relationship to other people on stage and that exchange it's not about the shape um yeah there's something bigger that's more important that comes across stronger I'm like no one's actually looking at your feet in this part <laughs> or like you know so exactly so I mean very humanistic it's just wonderful so the, you know the question the sort of leading question the elephant in the room here for this whole webinar really is do, do we think that um women bring women choreographers bring something new and different to ballet than men i mean you i don't know i mean that's really hard for me to say i the majority of my most influential teachers have been men they just have and they were amazing teachers um i do i did realize like after the cunningham company ended i was like wow i really never i worked with pam for a little bit before um dancing for Merce but like I never really work with women and I think just consciously thinking that kind of put it out in the universe and then I started working with Kimberly Bartosik and Rosie Herrera and Pam again of course and Sally Silvers and I was like oh I, there is definitely something different but I don't totally know what it is because all of those women have very different process I mean I really took a lot from Sally in making this piece like the way she works she makes um I mean, she's a very talented improviser and she's had a whole career shows where she just improvises. Um, and she would build a lot of material for me going back and looking through like decades of her videos of her improvising and pulling steps here and there and there. And so I'd have an idea and I'd like film myself. And then I kind of built some of these solos by just like grabbing clips here and there. So like um, she really influenced me a lot about how just to generate material. Um, I think there is, for me, there's been less of an emotional barrier between myself and female choreographers. I think we want to be very vulnerable um, in a way that's not weak. Um, I also will say that the other women on the program, um, Claudia is the one that's been making work the longest. and. Um, you know, I'd seen her work for a few years, especially in Bale, and I always thought it was good, but I wasn't like completely blown away. But her piece for Boston Ballet was incredible. I was just like, oh, that's what sustained support can do for a female choreographer, you know? And so I think that's amazing. There is something to that. I think that's a really important point. You're talking about sustained support because I mean, if we look yeah, at- Yeah, you're not gonna make a masterpiece in your first dance. Exactly. I mean, Pam's been doing this forever for a long time without any support. Yeah. And then 
gradual more support with the Guggenheim multiple times and that you know and and obviously now her affiliation with Bard it's like yeah you need sustained support yeah I mean we get down to finances here so well you know and ballet companies have the resources, resources to sustain yeah. female choreographers so I mean we're seeing at San Francisco the new hire the artistic director there um Tamar Rojo and Cincinnati Ballet so um okay we could keep going here so <laughs> part two getting women hired um <laughs> but stephanie maybe we'd want to open this up to questions melissa you've just really filled out a just really interesting picture and behind the scenes and um some provocative things have been said here today so <laughs> i'd be curious to know what questions we might have yeah, thank you both for uh, such a wonderful conversation. Um, I just want to remind our participants, you can drop a question in the chat. Um, you can also, as Michael is demonstrating for us right now, um, use the reaction button on your Zoom. There's a piece in there that says raise your hand, and I'll ask you to unmute um, and go ahead and ask that question. So, Michael, you're very first. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I thank you for this. It, it's really been interesting, fascinating, actually. Uh, I have two questions, Melissa, for you. One was, uh, in no particular order, mm -hmm. did you come to your work for the Boston Ballet with a preconceived idea about what your choreography was, or was it organic or a combination of both? And the second question is, how did your experience choreographing uh, with the core group of dancers that you work with at Boston Ballet, what does that how does it inform what you may do next? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, I'm i not an experienced choreographer, so I knew I couldn't just go into the room without a plan. <laughs> um, so like I, I said earlier, I had like this idea of like making, I made various solos and I thought I was gonna string them together, but I also, um, so I didn't know what the finished product would be necessarily, but I, um, I thought I would stop there. And then one of the solos became a group section. And then I got to know the dancers and I was like, oh, I wanna make a, something a little bit more for this person. And um, so I had like certain ideas for a rough structure, um, but it, it really did grow organically um, in the room. It was, February, 2021, I went and worked with them for about 10 days in person after working with them the November before on Zoom a few times. And then I went back for um, the week before the show, before the tech week. And at that point I'd had like a year away from it. Like I'd finished it and I was just so excited that I actually finished. <laughs> but then, um, you know, it sat for a year. And that's something that was also incredible about Boston Ballet. Like their rehearsal directors are amazing. Like the piece was as I left it, which never happens. Um, so I was able to go back in and kind of fill it out more and added more phrases and tried to complicate the piece a little bit more at times with still leaving some of it much more sparse. Um, so a combination of the two. I had a plan, but it also really um, organically grew from the people I was working with. The second question, um, one of the dancers who she said she really loved working, she's like, so are you gonna make another dance? Like, are you gonna come? And I was just like, it's premiering tonight. That's like right after I gave childbirth, someone asked me when I'm having my next kid. <laughs> I was like, too soon. <laughs> um, I actually do have a residency in a couple weeks at Carbondale in Colorado um, where, um, the director of another ballet company asked me to make something and I was like, ah, I don't, I said, no, maybe later. Um, but then she put me in touch with this composer and we've like really hit it off. I'm like, she's smart. She's like, <laughs> got me like hooked and I have these ideas. So I'm going to go and work on something by myself for a week and just see if I feel like it's going to go somewhere. Um, and if so, then I'll be making that piece for them. And if I'm like, nope, then I'm done <laughs> for now. So. Sarah, you're also a choreographer in your own right. I wonder if you have anything to add to Michael's questions. Yeah. 
great. Sorry, Stephanie, what did you say? Oh, sorry. I was going to, I was saying you're a choreographer in your own right. So I wonder if you have anything to add about, you know, your own process when you're going through things. Um, if that's any different than what Melissa has been describing about her process and how that sort of relates to, you know, our overall topic of what different um, things come when you have women in the room who are choreographing, you know, choreographing pieces versus maybe a, a more traditional or a male's perspective then. Yes, I, um... I see Lexi Tobash. Um, <laughs> well, I got to Dickinson in 2008. And so my focus has really been on building up the dance program here and also working closely with CPYB, which has been interesting for us. And we, uh, my colleague, Aaron Crawley Woods, who I see here is also basically the second half of the dance program, teaching all sorts of the advanced uh, modern dance techniques. But um, before that, when I ran my dance company in New York, I had always five people and like usually a couple of men and women, but it wasn't really based on partnering. It was just based on um, just kind of the mix of people. And there was kind of an androgynous sort of look to the company in a way, if you will. Um, and I did, you know, sort of come from the same soup that um, Melissa does in terms of working with who's in the room with you at that time. So rather than make five Sarah Skaggs dancers, and made five individual dancers who would come together with agreed things we would do together. And um, the emphasis at that time in terms of representing female bodies was more about a kind of athleticism. I mean, part of the training was running actually to be, uh, was also the ballet and modern training, but also to have a lot of stamina to work in my company. So that was a different kind of training, you know, in terms of having dancers who, had a huge amount of stamina. It was part of the aesthetic, but kind of very fast and quick and that kind of thing, if that makes sense to people. Yeah, absolutely. Lexi, I saw your hand, but then it went back down. Hi, Feel free Stephanie. to unmute. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hi, Lexi. <laughs> um, I actually had the opportunity to see the piece in Boston. I live just outside of Boston. And the opportunity to meet Stephanie. I know Sarah, it's nice to see you both. Melissa, thank you so much for your time today to speak to everyone. I also have two questions. Um, you know, it was interesting to hear that it, it sat for a year and then you had the opportunity to look at it again. So I don't know if this question is quite as relevant after learning that, but I was, you know, going to ask if you would, if there was something that you would change about the piece, yes. you know, after, <laughs> or even just like, if there's something that you would change in your like process, you know, you mentioned going into it, starting with individual solos and trying to mm -hmm. string them together. Would you change that, you know, kind of approach? Would you change the costumes? Just wanted to hear about uh -huh. your like, now that you've seen it. Now that I've seen it, honestly, it wasn't till right before um, that I was in a space that was going to be the size of the stage and I was like oh no I made it in this smaller studio and it doesn't have the same kind of I felt like it didn't really have the same kind of intimate resonance <laughs> on that huge stage and now that I know all the dancers and I'm like in love with all of them I'm like I want to remake it for all 13 of them in the one piece <laughs> um but I don't think I would change the process I mean I'm um, I'm still figuring out what my process is <laughs> and that's part of what the next residency I'm going by myself to like kind of figure out like how do I make material I've spent a whole career um, figuring out how to get in someone else's head and read someone else's mind I'm like what are my ideas <laughs> what is my process so um, I just still feel pretty relieved that I even finished something honestly and um, but yeah, seeing on that huge stage and getting to know all of them, I was like, I have ideas about how to keep the piece as it is, but have all 13 of them in it at the same time. <laughs> so I would have liked to do that, but you know, they like to have extra people available just in case someone goes out. <laughs> it is really just such an interesting thought to, you know, just to think of that many dancers on the stage like that. Um, my second question 
was, um, you know, did you have the opportunity to work with the other choreographers or like how were the pieces, you know, presented together, um, you know, determining like whose was going to go first and whose was going to go last and, you know, did you bounce ideas off of? No, I mean, um, their rehearsal directors always kind of ask my permission, but I think that's something I'm also learning that like, maybe I don't always need to be so accommodating. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, but I think the programming was actually really perfect, actually. But a lot of it had to do with casting and who was available, which night to, for this and that. Um, I mean, I think they tried to give all the dancers the opportunity to work with as many people as possible, which is great for individual growth and stuff. But it is kind of complicated in terms of then... <laughs> all the logistics and being able to have all your cast members when you need them and stuff. Um, But I didn't have a lot of interaction with the other dancers. I mean, I know Tyler and Claudia from um, working together in Vail and I knew Leah a little bit, mainly through social media because I danced with her brother who is an incredible dancer. Um, I danced with Jeffrey in Vail. And then um, Chantel, I met, well, we, all the choreographers did like a Zoom with the um, commissioner's circle early in the process, just to kind of meet each other and meet them and talk. And that was also at a time where we were only doing Zoom things for everything in our life all the time. And so that was actually really great energy. And then after that, I kind of was in touch with the other um women a little bit um just be like you know you feel so alone at that point and it's like oh we are in this together (laughs) um but then when it came showtime it's like we'd see each other in the halls at the ballet and just kind of grab each other for a minute to be like hey we're doing this oh my god (laughs) um but yeah there wasn't a lot of interaction in terms of um creatively or discussing programming it was really um up to their rehearsal directors who and Miko, um, which obviously that's what they do. That's part of their responsibility and they made the right call, I think. So I think we have time for one more. And maybe um, this kind of bleeds in. Cliff asked earlier if there were any publicly available videos, clips or trailers of the work that you're describing. For those of us who were in Boston, we got the chance to see it, but- um, It is streaming live now through Boston Ballet. Look um, at that. I'm, I think a few days after the program ended, it's, I think it's streaming for a couple weeks. Um, I'm not sure when it ends. Maybe I can look it up really quickly. But if you go to the Boston Ballet website, I'm sure it, um, it'll tell you it's um, maybe to the end of this month. Um, yeah. So if you look up choreographer, <laughs> then you should be able to. Um, get a link to this season. Great, and I will try my best to get that out to all of our attendees today. I saw one more come in. Can you, can you give us one more answer? I, I know we've peppered you already here, Melissa. We really appreciate your no, no, that. No, okay. um, so uh, in the chat from Cynthia, Melissa, you came here from Australia. What motivated you to come to the US to work in American companies? Are dancers from all over the world similarly attractive to move to this country? Um, I discovered like modern contemporary dance when I was about 13 or 14. And I was very lucky. I went to an amazing performing arts high school in Sydney um, that had incredible teachers. And, but for that kind of dance, um, there are very limited opportunities in Australia after um, high school education, there isn't even really that many tertiary um, institutions that really focus on it as a performer. It's more if you want to focus on education. And the head teacher of my high school knew Daniel Lewis, who at the time was um, the Dean of New World. And he started the National High School Dance Festival here, which part of that festival they have basically like a cattle call edition for colleges in the United States. And I got a full scholarship to New World. Um, I was offered a few scholarships for different schools, but New World was the only one that really focused on modern over ballet. 
I mean, we took ballet every day as well, but it was, um, you know, other than like Juilliard where you do both, it was a lot of the other schools that um, were auditioning were really more ballet focused. And I knew I wanted to be focused on modern dance. I mean, American dance is modern dance. So um, that's why I came here. And when I was in college, I did a Cunningham piece and I'd always loved every kind of dance. Like I've done some work with Michelle Darnes tapping and stuff recently. And I loved my Caribbean classes. I would take Fosse master classes. I would do, ev I loved everything. But when I took a Cunningham class, I felt like I finally had some direction. And then that's why I wanted to go to New York and study with Merce. And he was still alive, which, you know, I was going to 9 a.m. advanced Graham and then running to a company class with Merce at 1130. <laughs> but I ultimately was like, I really wanted to try and dance for Merce because he was still living. Um, and then that's how I met Pam and the rest is kind of history. <laughs> the rest is history. Mm -hmm. I want to be cognizant of everyone's time and say thank you to both of our speakers today for joining us and for all of you on the call for coming and listening in. Um, what a wonderful conversation and, and thank you so much. Um, I will try and send out some of those links um, as well as a link to this recording here after the session. Um, so, so stay tuned for that. And um, I just want to applaud both of our speakers. Thanks, Sarah. So thanks, Melissa, for being here today. Thanks, Cassidy. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I'm so happy to see all these, these people. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. This is great. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Sarah. <laughs> Keep dancing. <laughs> Melissa.